but we'll have Chris come up and he will introduce our speaker tonight. Give it up for Chris. Here we go. Where's that point? <laughs> so our speaker tonight, I've, I've known our speaker for, I don't know, five years or so. Uh, he helped launch Athletes in Action at Otterbein University. He was a starting quarterback. He's an All-American uh, athlete there. Uh, all a man, all-around man of God. I married him and his wife. And his wow. wife is, see, see, can you guys see this, this yes. pointer here? Yeah. So if you follow this pointer, his wife is right here. <laughs> Jesse. <laughs> Formerly Jesse Church, now Jesse Kincaid. They're both teachers. They're awesome. Let's hear it for Aaron Kincaid. All right, is this on? Okay, I'm adjusting to this. So if I scream, tell me to be quiet. Okay. Um, thank you, Chris. Um, I'm happy to be here. Um, AIA, I've been involved with it for five years, ever since Chris and I launched it at Otterbein. And in case you don't know what Otterbein is, it's a small D3 school <laughs> up in Westerville. Probably never heard of it. It may not exist anymore, um, but so AIA definitely definitely has a, a spot in my heart. Um, I am uh, encouraged to see so many of you taking the step to come out tonight. You could have done so many other things. You could have done homework. You could have gone and hung out with your friends. You could have gone to go eat even more food because you're athletes, so you eat a lot of food anyway. Um, but you took the step to come here, and that's, that's sometimes the hardest thing to do. So you, you did it. Um, and, and I'm encouraged by that. Um, tonight, what I'm talking about is principle number two um, in this series of principles uh, that's going to help you become closer um, and connect God, sport, and life all together. Okay, so last week, last week you talked about principle one, all right, audience of one. Um, and just real briefly here, so you talked about who or what do I worship? Okay, what, what takes command of, of your sport or, or what your attention goes towards, right? Um, you talked about counterfeit gods, false idols. So it's very easy, it's very easy to give your attention to pretty much anything nowadays, especially on your phone, technology, I mean, advertisement, like anything. False idols are everywhere, and they very easily just take all of it, your attention and time, right? And so... Um, what Chris ended up talking about was responding daily to Jesus. So learning that, um, you know, to play for an audience of one, to play for God, all right, that he created you, and like ultimately that we play our sport as a way to worship him, okay? So he is our audience of one. Tonight, we are talking about inside game. We're talking about motivation, okay? And in a lot of ways, a lot of ways, these two are going to mesh, all right? Kind of how all the principles mesh. I want, it's not a coincidence. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about motivation and this is the thing that I want you to take away from tonight. So that's, there it is right there. That's the whole point. What does God say about you? Okay. And so, um, the way we're going to kind of start this off is I want you to watch this video. This video is about a minute long and I want you to think about some of the motivation that you see in the video. All right. And then we'll, we'll debrief afterwards. You might have to hit play, I don't think I can do did you see in the video? Obviously there's people. What were they motivated by? Being chased. Okay, being chased. So what 
what was the motivation? Was it like in a word? Fear. Fear. There you go. Good. What else? <clears throat> Hunger. Okay. So we got the girl. I mean, I just immediately thought of Pocahontas because the whole giddy up, you know, she's <laughs> chasing after that deer. Like, like come back. Man. Okay, so fear. Hunger. What else? Uh, justice. Justice. Police officer. Yeah. Okay. Actually, I hadn't thought about that from the other perspective. I was thinking about the dude running from him. <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No, that wasn't me, man. It wasn't me. All right. Good. So um, we, we could go on. We could go on. There's more. Um, but I'm on a time schedule here. Uh, they have various reasons for what they're doing and why they're doing it, right? So I want you to think of, can you actually click me to the next slide? This is, it's a fault in Google Docs or in Google Slides. Um, so I, there's various words up here on the screen. I just want you to think in your head, what are, what are some of the things that motivate you on a day-to-day -day basis? Maybe some of them might not be on the screen, but this should just kind of get your thought process going. What are some of the things that motivate you daily? Okay, and, and as you're thinking about that, as you're thinking about um, that, you know, what, what gets you going, you know, what energizes you on a day-to-day -day basis, I want you to think about that for the rest of the, the time that I'm up here. But what I want to do is I want to challenge your thinking, and I want to ask you why are you motivated by that? So why is it you are motivated by your coach? Why is it you're motivated by money? Why are you motivated by success and accomplishment? What's the reason? Like, what's, what's the why to that? You know, I, that's what I want. That, I want the deep stuff. Why do those things motivate you? Um, and so what I'm going to do is I, there's, a, there's a story in the Bible in Luke. Um, so if you have the Bible app on your phone, um, go ahead, pull that out. We're in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. If you don't have a Bible, I'm going to read this out loud. Um, I teach English on a day-to-day -day basis, and, you know, that's what I'm realizing more and more. Sometimes it's nice just to sit there and have somebody read to you, you know, <laughs> something soothing about it. Um, so you can follow along. I'm going to read this real quick, and then we're going to break it down. Do -do -do. Um, <laughs> okay, so Luke 15. All right, so this is the... This is the the parable of the prodigal son here. Okay, so to kind of like set the scene, there's a younger son, there's an older son, there's a father. And that's all you need to know. Okay, so it starts in verse 11. It says, And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the, give me the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into, the, into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the same pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger, with pigs? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fattened calf and kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. For this, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of, his serv one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf, because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. 
But when, his, but when this son of yours came who has devoured your property and, or with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Okay. <laughs> kind of a longer story. Kind of a longer story, but very, very simple. Very simple, very uh, easy to visualize here. So I kind of, I broke it down into the three, the three different parts that I want to talk about real briefly here. Okay, so I want to talk about the younger son first. So the younger son, all right, he went up to dad. He's like, yo, dad, give me my inheritance, right? And then he peaced out, right? He peaced out and he was motivated by worldly pleasures, right? He was seeking an independent life from the father. Now, why? Why was he seeking that, okay? We can look at this and say, like, all right, we, we struggle with this on a day-to-day -day basis, right? We struggle with worldly ple pleasures. You know, we put our money into, like, oh, man, I just got to get a pair of Beats. You know, I got to get some Jordans. You know, I got to get all that stuff, and then I'll, be, I'll have value. I'll have worth, right? Um, so we struggle with that same thing. So in, in that way, we kind of know what he's going through. So he's seeking those things to fulfill him, right? He goes out. He blows it all off. What happens? He runs out of all those things. That, that's a dead end. It's a dead end, and he is left unsatisfied. That's actually kind of hard to read. I apologize. Um, but in the end, in the end, he returns to the father because only he can satisfy. It. Because he knew, like ultimately, only the father, only the father can give me worth, can give me my uh, my identity, my satisfaction, right? And, and he returns to the father just hoping to be treated like a servant. But instead, the father says, No, no, no. Like, we're, we're throwing a party. Like, my son is back. Yeah. Right? So he throws a party, right? So that's the younger son. Okay? The older son. All right, now, once his brother comes back, like, okay, typically, you know, you're going, growing up through high school. Maybe you have a sibling. You know, it's, it's usually like the fighting stage, right? Like, you just are kind of like, oh, man, I hate her. Oh, I hate him. Okay? And then you get older. You mature. And then your siblings become some of the closest people to you in your life, right? So this guy, the older son, all of a sudden, younger bro comes back, and he's just like, are you serious? Like, here, I, I've been perfect. I've done everything right. I've never made a mistake. And you gave him the fattened calf? You gave me a goat. You know, he's mad, right? So that's like, I don't know, that's steak dinner compared to like, you know, hungry man, like put it in the microwave, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> he got, younger bro got the, he got the hookup. Um, but anyway, so older son, motivated by self-righteousness, performance, performance on a day-to-day -day basis. Like, man, I'm never messing up. I'm always comparing myself. I'm constantly seeking fulfillment through performance, right? And so what happens? Still isn't enough. Still not enough. After all that time, not enough. And eventually, he, the father says, like, hey, you know, what, what his father has to say is like, hey, listen, you're, you're always mine. And what is mine is always yours. That you're always my son. Okay, so that, that brings us to the father. And, and in case you didn't see some of this up here, the younger son represents us. Older son represents us. Now, father represents God. So God, the father's response in this story, right? So he restores the pleasure-seeking son. And we kind of talked about that. Right when he got there, he threw a party for him. Because he's like, no, no, no. Like, I don't care what anybody says about you. Like, I don't care what happened when you took your wealth and just squandered it, meaning like just blew it off, you know, got, used it all, right? He's like, I don't care about that because you're my son. You are my son, my family. Like, I love you. Threw him a party. He reminds his performance-driven son, like, listen, like, relax, relax. Like, you are still my son, and I still care about you, and all that is mine is still yours. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to do that. So ultimately, he guides their identity. He guides their motivation back to him, saying, listen, get your heads right. You stop going off blowing just like money and doing all this stuff, trying to find value out there because it ain't there and it didn't work, right? And you stop trying to be perfect, all right? You don't need to be, all right? And, um, and so his love never changes despite what they seek. So the world's, the world's formula for your identity, okay? So this is, kind of, is going to go back right into the application, day-to-day -day basis for you. The world's formula says your identity is based upon your performance and others' opinions. You can think right now, 
of an example that that is true for. Of a time when you based what you felt or thought about yourself based on somebody else's opinion. A coach, a family member, a friend, a critic, right? Those newspaper people, those journalists, they just like to write whatever, right? Um, and you based it, you may just, you, you let yourself feel not okay about yourself because it's what somebody else said. Or maybe, um, like I know Caitlin mentioned in her testimony that like just, man, I'm working harder than anybody. I'm working harder than anybody and it ain't working out. It's not leaving me filled, right? And that's the performance part of it. That's exhausting. That's exhausting. I relate to that extremely well. I, that's, that's like who I struggled to be for 18 years of my life until I found Jesus. Um, but, um, but you know, like you, you just, you're constantly putting in, putting in, putting in, right? And it doesn't end up going the way you thought it was. And then all of a sudden you feel like nothing because you, you felt like you deserved it because you, you were motivated by your performance. Now, God's formula says that your identity comes from what God says about you, meaning nothing else matters. I know that sounds simple, but it's true. It's that simple, right? It's that simple. So what does God say about you? And this is, this is, where, this is how I'm challenging your thinking. Right? You're, you find motivation about things because you're trying to fill a void. You're trying to fill something. So like if I'm motivated, I'm motivated by success, right? Well, I just want to feel value. I want to feel worth. If I could just be a national champion, then hey, I mean something. I'm significant. Or oh, if I have enough money, then maybe that person will think that I'm cool. And then, you know, on and on and on with all those examples. But in the end, it's a dead end. It's a dead end. But what God has to say about you will last. It won't be a dead end, right? And so here's, here's just the first thing, right? First thing, basics here. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. Okay? In simple terms, if you, chose, if you choose to accept Jesus in your life, and you believe that he saved you from your sins and, he, and that he is your savior, right? You have been adopted into God's family. You are one of his children. It's that simple. There's no second guess. I used to second guess it because I was like, oh man, now hold on a second, hold on. If I learned anything in my life is that it ain't that simple, right? No, but it is, seriously. You don't know me, but that's seriously. <laughs> um, you're part of God's family. And what, it, what he says about being part of his family is that you do not live in fear again. You don't live in fear again. You're part of his family. Now the only thing that matters is what God says about you. Not what other people say. Not what your motivations were last year, the year before that. What your motivations might be tomorrow, right? Ultimately, he's, you're part of his family. He wants you to keep your attention on him. Okay, second part. What are God's intentions with you as part of his family, right? I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Being part of God's family, that's, that's what he wants for you. He wants you to be part of it so that he can give you a full and abundant life. And spoiler alert, it's not what you thought you planned in your head. You know, it, it doesn't work like that. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that as I continue to grow in life experience, the more I realize that like, man, the more I try to control my life and the more I try to be motivated by things that aren't what God says about me, the more disappointed that I get because I, ultimately I'm trying to take control of my own life. And my own thoughts, my own plan for my own life cannot even compare to what God has planned for you. He created you. He created this earth, right? So he says, hey, listen, if you believe in Jesus as your savior, right? You believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins so that you may have life, right? Then you're part of his family. If you're part of his family, you don't live in fear. And if you're part of his family, he wants to give you abundant life, right? So now, now what we're gonna do, you have a paper on your table, okay? It looks like, it looks like this. It's, it's a double-sided paper here, okay? What I wanna do, is I want for us in small groups, probably like groups of three to four-ish, okay? 
I want us to investigate this paper. Now, what, what's on this paper? I'm glad you asked. Um, this paper in the left column, all right, in the left column on like the actual bracket side, sorry, I should have labeled like one and two or something. Um, on this side, right? So on the left side, it says the world's view of you, what the world says. Now, this is where the motivation piece is gonna connect. And you're going to think, like, okay, what's this random guy talking about? Like the motivation, how does this all connect, right? So this is where the motivation piece is going to connect, right? So the first one, it, it says, I must gain acceptance by proving that I deserve it since my value is always earned and never given, okay? And then you're going to go over to the right, to the right side, all right? And that's going to give you specific scripture that you can meditate on, you can pray on it, you can memorize it, right? And it's going to prove, or it's going to say, hey, this is what God says about you in that area, right? So you, and I'm going to let you all kind of investigate this paper together. Um, you know, but like another one down here, like I am significant if I'm a starter and praised for positive, producing positive results, right? <laughs> that's, that's hard. That's hard. Some people, some people get away with it. And I know that Chris probably talked about Tom Brady. Chris mentioned Tom Brady last week. Like, who else produces more than Tom Brady? There, nobody. Tom Brady, like, that dude, man, he can. Aaron Rodgers is coming up quick, though. Um, but, but still, though, if you want to talk about, like, full, like, top-of-the-line success, like, if, if I was a college athlete, or when I was a college athlete, um, <laughs> right, what, what am I trying to model my game? Like, why wouldn't it be Tom Brady? Won three Super Bowls. In two of them, he was the MVP. I mean, goodness gracious, it doesn't get any higher than that. So just that alone, I'm significant if I'm a starter and praise for producing positive results. Like even Tom Brady, he did that and he still admitted like, man, there's gotta be something more. Like there's gotta be something more. Like my motivation was to prove everybody wrong that, oh man, he's a seventh rounder. Like he's a schmuck, right? He can't play. And then he went and did what he did. He's like, oh really, right? And it still, it was a dead end. His motivation was in the wrong place. He was motivated by what other people said about him. He was motivated by earthly things such as trophies that ultimately, like, shoot, there's some people on that Patriots team, they sold their rings on eBay. Like, they work so hard, and then they sell, like, the one thing that, like, helps them, you know, whatever. So I'm just like, okay, so clearly, maybe in our position as, as younger people, right, and in college, for sure, like, you look at that, like, man, oh, I get to that point, I'm good, right? And it's hard to understand, but then you get to that point, you're like, what else? You're empty again. It was a dead end, but maybe you spent 25 years chasing that trail, and at the end of 25 years, it's a dead end. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to investigate this. Go down the left side, read all the different things, all the like true examples of motivation, what you tell yourself about yourself or what other people say about you. Right, and then read the truth. And I want you to one, I want you to pick one. Just pick one of those truths that you're gonna focus on for the next week, okay? And then two, I also want you to talk to your group about how, how are you gonna hold yourself accountable to that? How are you gonna hold yourself accountable to focusing on that truth? So for example, if I was chosen, choosing the significance because I'm a starter, right? Like how am I gonna wake up daily and remember that my worth, my value does not lie in the results that I produce. Because God says that I'm significant and God gives me a purpose because I'm part of his family. Like I'm his son or I'm his daughter, okay? So we're gonna take some time, get in like groups of three to four, have some good conversation here, and then <coughs> we'll, we'll bring it back up when we're ready, okay?
besides freshman year, I never had that doubt. And so it's the year that I was going to be a king. And this year, like my senior year, I had all the things that I wanted to do. And like, my coach kind of started to sacrifice the table for me last week. And I was like, I don't know if it's like, I know it, but like, it doesn't hurt. It's the only year, but it doesn't hurt me. I just need to stop. And I was like, wow, this is how long it's going to be. And so it's two years to do that. And like, you know, I'm not sure if I'm satisfied with this. Quickly, 
quickly, I just want, I want to hear from somebody, maybe, maybe two people. We got time for two people that we can hear from. What did you What did you come up with? Um, I feel that like a lot of these things that are happening right now um, on the left side, my views as an athlete doesn't necessarily hinder me because um, I always I'm really big into my sport and like I'm I'm really hard on myself and I'm, I allow the people like the views to like motivate me. Not necessarily because of me, but it's more of like the people who helped me get here, like my family, and I put like a lot of emphasis on like my resources that got me here, like are including God. Um, I like let my mistakes fuel me, and I let like their views kind of like push me towards it because I feel that at the end I want to celebrate for like everyone, not necessarily just me. Like it's not a selfish need to. Win. Like if I end up winning in NCAA's or making an Olympic teams, it's not necessarily for me. Like I'm not doing it for that. It's I'm doing it necessarily for the people who helped me get here in my position. And so I'm allowing them and I'm allowing like that weight on my shoulders and that extra pressure to actually motivate me and push me farther because at the end I want that celebration. Yeah, and don't. Don't mistake what I've been saying. Like I'm not saying that um, that motivation. You know, it, it, I'm not saying it's it's wrong to be motivated by some of these things. I'm not saying that at all. Um, so in, in a lot of cases, yes, you're absolutely you're absolutely right. I mean, you're going to be motivated by you know family members, people that have helped you, and, it, and it's going to be in a good way, and it can be in an, an unselfish way. Um, so when you, when you look at it, what lies at the core of it? What, why is that? Why is that your motivation? That's that's all. You know, as you continue to think about this through through the week and going into next week, rolling into principle three. Um, you know, again, being motivated, not a not a bad thing in and of, in and of itself, right? But what's the why? Why are you motivated? So, um, and again, it could be a good thing. It could be a good thing. You'd be motivated in all the right ways. You know, at the end of the day, are you motivated because of what other people say about you? Or are you motivated because of what God says about you? Something that's not going to change. Okay? Uh, one more. One more. Some sort of feedback. Thank you. Um, during my career, probably one of the biggest things for me was being a starter and producing positive results. Um, not only did I see myself like going in and getting recruited, like coming to Ohio State, I saw myself being a like, producer and a key on my team. Um, but I couldn't stand the thought of me getting to the end of my athletic career. Again, it's it's a journey. Everybody's journey is going to be a little bit different. God's you know God's plan for everybody's going to be a little bit different. You know, it's not all going to be the same. Um, you know, but sometimes sometimes in those scenarios, like you already know people that have been injured. You know, like all of a sudden, like yeah, like I put all my eggs into that basket. That was my motivation, my core, my core reasons. Like I got you know I got to be a starter, and then bam, all of a sudden, talk to Chris about his story. What happened to Chris? And then all of a sudden, it's just gone. And then it's like. Oh, did I just waste 23 years of my life or did I just waste 20 years of my life and now it's gone what am I supposed to do now it happens and it happens like that and I don't know if it I mean yeah anyway um, so one one thing one thing that I do want to pass on to you so as a, in a way of keeping yourself accountable all right are, are these things called focal points Okay, you'll, you'll talk about this again at some point um, but what a focal point is and, and this is a good plug to go to UTC, go to Puerto Rico, um, go to one of those camps because you'll learn more about it. But a, a focal point is when um, you know you kind of like mark yourself up. So, to me, in in my era, I guess I'm not that old yet. Um, but like Tim Tebow, like that was the epitome of a focal point was when he'd wear his eye black and it said Philippians 4:13 on it. And what that did for him is that was his focal point. So focal meaning like to single in on something, right? His focal point to remind him of like, what did he play for? Why was he on the field? For Tim Tebow, I'm sure he'd tell you like, hey, football is my way to worship God. It's my way. It's my platform to share the gospel by how hard I play and various other things. Okay. Um, that's a different story for later, right? But that's a focal point. So a great way this week that you can apply 
your, you know, what you're, what you're discovering about motivation and, you know, ultimately, what does God say about me? And is it more important than what other people say about me, right? Write it on your hand. I'm not saying you, you don't need to, like, cut it out of your sleeve or something. Like, that, that might be a little intense, right? But, like, write it somewhere that you can see. So when you wake up and, like, or maybe, like, you write it on your hand. So every time you go to shake somebody's hand, right, you see it right there on your thumb. Right? Or maybe at practice, you put, it, you put it on a piece of tape, put it on your equipment, whatever your equipment for your sport is. <laughs> right? I just want to say helmet, but not everybody wears a helmet. So, um, so that's, just, that's just an easy way. But um, again, think about it. Take one of those things. Apply it this week. You're only going get to get out of it as much as you put into it. Same thing with your sport. That's, that's how relationship, like if you don't put anything into a relationship with Christ, if you're there, right? Some of you aren't there yet. You're just here like, what is this dude talking about, right? But you're only going to get out of it as much as you put into it. Um, and I can say that AIA, AIA has changed my life significantly, <laughs> significantly. And I came from a background in young life, but AIA taught me how to function as an independent adult when sports was no longer in the picture. And it also taught me how to compete in a Christ-like way when sports was in the picture. Um, and so with that being said, I'm, I'm going to make a plug for the Xenia Retreat because I've been like four or five times. And it's incredible the connections you make with all these athletes from all over the place. And if you've never been before, just try it. But I think there's a little video here. Um, thank you again for letting me come talk. Um, I think they're going to come back up after the video. So thank you again.